How many of you really came expecting something today from the Word of God? I mean, you really said, hey, maybe something today. And so we're going to try to give you that. Uh, At least Jesus is going to give you that because most of what we're saying today comes from the mouth of Jesus, which is always cool, right? Like Pastor Jordan said, we are continuing this this series on the Sermon on the Mount. It's going to last a long time because Jesus had a lot to say to us. And uh, I would say this, that if you didn't get last week's message for whatever reason, it uh, be good to go back and get it because I listened to it last night. We were in Long, uh, we, where were we last week? Uh, Ocean Springs last week. And so we listened to it last night. Good preaching. Very good stuff to set the, the trajectory for what we're sharing about the kingdom of God because that's what Jesus came to tell us about. And here he's given us the heart of the kingdom of God. He started with the Beatitudes, which last year we, we had a, a series on that. This really is an extension of that. And so uh, kind of just to set the stage so you know what's happening, he, he's on the side of a mountain and he's speaking to all kinds of different people. He's got disciples there, the people that are really following him. He's got potential disciples that are kind of checking it out, wondering what's going on. They heard about the miracles and things. You've got Gentiles there that don't believe anything, the pagans. You've got probably Roman soldiers that are there. And then you've got the the faithful crew of the Pharisees and, and the scribes and those religious leaders that are trying to figure out who is this guy and what is he trying to do to us and our thing, and the Word of God. And so uh, last week was the heart of the law. You'll get that. And today we're going to share with you about the heart of love. And, and one of the key words here is love, of course, but also heart, because the heart is so important. And so many times we give a lot of attention to our head or to our body, our emotions and those things, but we should give a lot of more attention to our heart. You know, the, the, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, Ezekiel said that I'm going to take the stony heart out of you and give you a heart of flesh, and I'm going to write commandments upon those heart, that, that, that fleshly heart, not, not just hard commandments on a stone, but, but commandments that rule our heart. You know, it's, it's amazing that um, Proverbs says to guard your heart because out of it flows the abundance of your life. All the issues of your life come from your heart. And so if you've been living around in your head a lot, let it just drop down today a little bit in your heart, and let's see what God has to say about that. So we're going to begin this, but I want to start by doing this. We're going to pray, and and we're going to ask God to help us open our heart today. And uh, you're going to leave here today something in your heart that's different than when you got here. Can you, you believe that with me? Can we believe that together? So let's pray. Father, we are asking you in the name of Jesus to help us today that you would help us open our hearts and that, God, you would examine us as we examine ourselves. And, Lord God, that your word would find fertile ground in this heart of mine. And that, God, I would leave here today more like Jesus than when I came. I'm going to thank you for that. We're going to praise you for that in Jesus' name, Father. Amen and amen. The heart of love and several different areas we're going to talk about today. One is we're going to talk about right now uh, the heart of love in spite of anger. Now let me preface this by saying this, that I would dare say that every one of you in this room at least one time in your life have been angry. Could we say that? Is that a safe statement? Some of you got real angry this morning. Some of you are angry right now. I mean, you are some upset, man. Something happened yesterday afternoon about 4 p.m. that you just, it's eating you up, man. And you are just, and so you're in the right place because we're going to help you with your heart. So we're going to begin with uh, Matthew chapter uh, 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. And Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So let me stop right there and say, what Jesus is doing is he's come on the scene and he's saying, folks, this is what you've heard uh, and this is what you've learned from tradition and this is what you've read in the, in the Pentateuch, in the, in the, in the law, and you, you've got it down pat and you know that it says thou shalt not kill. You know that. You've got that down pat. And he says, you've learned it from old. That if you, do, if you do this thing, you're going to be liable. You're going to be in danger of the judgment of the moral law. Deuteronomy chapter 16, he said, I want you to get judges in Israel, and I want you to judge the people according to the law. And so you're going to be in danger. You're going to be liable for that. And they're, they're probably saying that. And I could just see the religious leader and say, go, Jesus, yes. 
you have nailed it, bro. We're with you. He says, but, anytime you see the word but in the scripture, it's like something is coming on that's different. He says, but I say to you, this is what I'm telling you, I'm going to go deeper in the teaching. He said, I'm saying to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment of God. Mm. He's going a little bit deeper here. He said, I know what the letter of the law says, like last week you learned, but I'm going to give you the heart behind it all that even if you, look what he's saying, he's saying, even if you are going to, well, how does he put it? But I say to you that everyone who is angry, and that's not talking about being kind of upset. Look, we all get upset. I get upset when the guy in front of me or the woman in front of me doesn't go uh, on the traffic signal because they're on their phone. You know that. And I never do that myself. But when I do that, I speed up real quick and catch up with the car in front of me. Don't you do that? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be one of those. But I am one of those. But he says, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about being kind of perturbed about stuff. We're talking about enraged with anger. We're talking about extremely exacerbated. We're talking about being upset to the point where you want to kill somebody. That's what Jesus is saying right here. He's saying if you do that, you're in danger of the judgment. Some of the translations even go a little bit further and say, if you're angry with your brother without a cause. And a lot of times, I'm sure you've been like this, but you've been angry with something, and then when you find out the truth, you say, oop, I missed that. I jumped the gun on that. Oh, I've got the proverbial egg on my face. How many of you have had egg on your face? I have many times as a pastor jumped the gun and made a judgment that was... Not exactly the way it should have been. And you're all looking at me like you have never done that before. And I'm just, I'm just going to move forward because it, evidently you got that. He says, man, you're going to be liable to the judgment of God. If see, see how he's turning it and going deeper into what he's teaching. And then whoever insults. His brother. Now, the word brother here doesn't mean like brother and sister in the church. Just It means any human being, actually. It really means any person who has come through the womb and, and been born. So he's saying if you insult people, meaning that if you disrespectful or you're scornfully abusive in your remarks or your action, with your brother, you're going to be liable to the council. He's saying the Sanhedrin is going to come and take care of you. You're going to stand before the court. Hmm. Insulting scornfully speaking about somebody. Folks, listen to me now. Now, don't put up a wall on this. Let's, can we just do this right now so we can go on with the rest of the message? Can we just admit that we are guilty of most of these things already? So easily we just say things about people. And he's saying here, wow, look at this. You're liable to the council. And then he goes further and he says, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to to the hell of fire. Wow. The place of ultimate punishment. Now, you fool. Really what it means here, it's just an insult. It's just an insult. It's, it's, it's really, in Psalm 14, it's translated blockhead. Now, we're not talking about Mr. T. You fool, you, you fool. We're not talking about that. You know, when we were kids, in our neighborhood, we had a lot of kids, but we had three, my first cousin, my second cousin, and me, and we hung together a lot. And you know what happens when you got kids where there's three of them? What happens? Ultimately, the two is going to turn against one. I mean, it happens all the time. And then what happened to us, and one day, you know, if your bike didn't, uh, if your bike didn't run, if you had a flat tire, you were out that day, and everybody's riding bikes that day but you. And so we, got, we had a cousin, and he wasn't very athletic and all. We were playing ball, and we had him pitching because that was the easy thing, and he was just no good at all at ball. He was horrible. And so we started calling him, you fool, you, you fool. You fool, you, you fool. You missed it again, you fool. And at first it was fun. Everybody was laughing, and he was laughing. But as the day went on, he wasn't laughing anymore. And he wasn't the type of guy that would fight you, really, until you lit his fuse and then he was actually bigger than both of us. We're not even talking about that. That's just kids. We're talking about adult people who are saying, you fool. It's a term of abuse. It's a term that, that, de that just denigrates somebody, just breaks people in two. You fool, you, you blockhead. And now if you read your Bible, 
You read, you, you read in the book of Galatians where Paul talks to the Galatian believers and he says, you foolish Galatians. And so if you're not careful, you'll say, well, wait a minute now. One, one verse says, Jesus says, don't call a person a fool. Now you've got the, one of the head apostles calling people foolish. But really, it's two totally different words. And that's why you need to study the Bible. Paul was saying to the Galatian believers, you're just kind of unintelligent. You're just really sensual people. That's why you've been bewitched. That's why you've been taken off course. And so Jesus sets the, the trajectory here for the kingdom of God about how we treat people and what we say to people and even when we're angry with people. And then he goes a little bit further. In verse 23, he says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Now, let me stop right there. That's like you coming to church this morning and about on the second song, or during the communion, you realize that someone has something against you. I love the way Jesus put it. He didn't say that you realize that someone, you know, that you have something against somebody. He didn't, he didn't say, he said, if you think in your mind, if you realize that somebody in the body has something against you, then, then he says something really strange. He says, leave your gift. Now, we're in the temple, and we're bringing our gift, our sacrifice, our gift, our offering. And he says, leave it. Now, I thought worship of God was the paramount thing. I really thought that, you know, how could you go any further? I mean, worshiping Jesus. I'm not leaving the throne of God. But here he says, leave the throne of God. Leave your gift at the altar. Leave it right there. And then go. In other words, get up and go. He says, first be reconciled to your brother, and then you come and you offer your gift. I did that one time years and years and years ago. We were preaching from this text, and it, right here when I got here, I just stopped the service, and I said, now, right now, if any of you in here realize that someone in this room has something against you, you have, a, you have a right right now to just leave this word and go and be reconciled to them. And lo and behold, to my astonishment, people got up out of their seat and went across the auditorium and sat by someone and put their arm around them and they spoke and evidently were reconciled. It used to work that way. One Sunday I said, how many of you cuss all the time? About 14 people just raised their hand up. It was like just a reflex. Just I do that all the time. We've become a little bit more sophisticated now. But Jesus says it's more important to be reconciled to people than it is to bring a gift to me. I want that to sink in with you today. And me too. Wow. Wow. Because the Lord, he'll just knock and say, you know what? You got that problem with that person. It'd be good to do that. I don't know the outcome of it, but first go and then be reconciled. You see what you need. You need a heart, folks, that's moved. We have to have a heart that's moved, not just a head that analyzes and says, well, that's good, maybe so. It's got to be a heart that's moved, that reacts to the presence of God, that reacts to the voice of God, and that acts upon the voice of God. And when you do that, amazing things happen. Then he goes on and he says, I want you to come to terms, verse 25, come to terms or agreement quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Then he says, truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now what is he saying? He's saying, settle out of court. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this just in a few minutes. He says, settle out of court. You know what? It's always better to settle out of court, right? I mean, just because you, you know what happens? Sometimes when you go to court, you feel like, oh, you and your lawyer, you got it all figured out. Yeah, we got this thing nailed. And then you get in the courtroom, man, and all of a sudden the table turns and you leave in worse shape than when you got there. Yeah, we used to do that as kids. Mama, Tommy's hitting on me. Damn, he's hit on me. Come here. Come both of you. And when she finds out, Van, go over there. Paddling. Pow, pow, pow. I shouldn't have brought that to mommy in the first place. 
Should have settled out of court, right? Should have settled in the backyard. But really, we're talking about unbridled anger. Now listen, folks, you got to bridle your anger down. Because unbridled anger is progressive. It moves forward. It always starts with some kind of offense. And then, of course, you get angry. And then you're so angry you won't forgive. Even though you know you should, you won't forgive. Even though the Lord said you won't forgive. And then for unforgiveness, where, where does it lead to? It leads to resentment. Man, resentment, if it's not dealt with, leads to bitterness. And this, you're not going to stop this unless you stop it. It's moving forward. You're going to be resentful. And then resent, resentment takes place so deep in you that you start plotting revenge. And you plan, how can you get back? When is the opportunity that I can turn the table on them? And then, you know what? Revenge gives way to wrath, and wrath is really executing revenge. No, you're wrathful. And any time wrath takes place, destruction follows. And I have seen this take place dramatically, completely. As a matter of fact, these steps were given to me by the Lord many, many years ago, about 35 years ago, when something just really traumatic happened in our church back in Louisiana. And we saw this work out in a person's life until finally that person was killed. They lost their life. And so you want to bridle this thing. And, you know, you say, well, Jesus, that's a good message. Are you finished? He said, no, I'm not finished. He didn't stop here. He continues to push and raise the bar. And now he wants to talk to us about a heart of love concerning retaliation. Concerning retaliation, 38th verse. Now, we're skipping down. We're going to skip uh, verse 27 through 37 right now. We're going to pick that up in another couple of weeks, a week or so, whenever you'll see it happening. But for continuity and contextualization, we're going here to verse 38. He says, you have heard that it was said, and here it is, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He said, that's what you've heard. Now, you, you ever wonder why God said in the law an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Because he knows us. And he knows that if somebody takes your eye, you're not just going to take their eye. You won't take their whole head. You understand? You're not just going to take a tooth. You're going to pull all them teeth out. You know what I'm talking about. That's how we, we are. We, we very seldom, you know, pay one for one. We always want to get a one up. You hurt me bad, I'm going to hurt you badder. You know what I'm talking about. So he says, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And now here he is going to correct it. He's flipping a little bit. He says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Talking about taking revenge. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. Now, I don't like that. And, and you may say, well, what's Jesus talking about? Because how many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you really have been slapped on one cheek and then you turn to the other cheek? He's not saying that that is a normal procedure that happens all the time. He's teaching us from extremes. And you're going to see he's teaching from extremes on how to handle people and not get all caught up in this progression of offense, this unbridled anger. He said, don't resist the evil one. You know, there's a lot of people today, and really, and I see it because I'm alive and I can hear and have eyes, and just resisting everything. I mean, every person that's got a little bit different viewpoint on something, like, bang. But I realize now for the last three years or so, real strongly, that different is not always wrong. You got to understand that, folks. Different isn't wrong. How you handle your money, how you, what kind, what you want, how you handle your kids, how you do it. Different is not wrong. I realize now that a lot of people doing things a whole lot different than I'm doing it. And as an example, I say, you know, that's not bad at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes I say, you know what? I need to change. I want to do it their way because their way is better than mine. And then he says, if anyone would, would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. He said, it ain't going to happen to me, bro. I tell you what, you ain't taking nothing from me. But Jesus is saying, look, you're too involved with this thing of getting back and staying even. He's using extremes. They take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go to one mile, go with him too. Now he said, well, what does that mean? Well, it, you know, it, it really was a thing that was happening then. Any Roman citizen, usually the Roman army, the infantry, at any time could, could be walking down a path and if they see a Jewish person, they could stop them from doing what they were doing and say, here, carry my stuff. Carry my stuff for one mile. You can just look that up. That's just in the history books. And, and Jesus is saying when they do that to you, now you can imagine that you're working real hard plowing your field and all of a sudden some, 
some little little infantry dude, a little private, says, hey, you over there. Hey, Hebrew, come here. Carry my stuff from out. Jesus says, don't get all tied up in retaliation. Don't get up into tearing him down. Just carry it to my house. Do you see how that goes against your nature? Do you feel what you feel feeling inside right now? How you say, I, that Jesus. Well, Jesus doesn't really care how you feel. In case you were wondering, Jesus says, carry it two miles. And then he says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who borrows from you. You, you know, folks, we, look, generosity is, is a character trait of God. Now, now listen, I know that sometimes we see people that are asking for money and we can find all kind of things wrong with them. As a matter of fact, can I just be honest with you? Anytime a person is sitting on the corner of a street in our city in the rain with a cardboard sign, something is dreadfully wrong. There's some hurt. There's some pain. There's so- something's wrong. Look, look, I'm not going to sit on the corner with a cardboard sign. But sometimes when we pass, if not, I'm not saying you have to give to everyone because if you did, you give your whole paycheck, paycheck away because they got a whole lot of folks at the corners now. But the fact of the matter is this, is not to judge them. And sometimes if the Lord prompts you to give, you give in obedience to the Lord, not what that person may do with your few dollars. And that's where we miss God so much. Well, you know, we'd give away bikes to the needy kids on Christmas time, but however, what about those parents who are throwing their money away and they didn't buy a bike for their kid? Give the bike a kid. Give the kid a bike. Maybe give the kid a bike. Maybe give the bike a kid. (laughs) And don't worry about it. It's in obedience to the Lord. Generosity from the heart. Giving everything with nothing in return is the way that Jesus always said. Matter of fact, he said, what good is it if you invite people to your house who can then invite you back to their house? Oh, my. Now, Paul, Paul illustrates this. I think in the best way possible. Paul was in a city. He's writing this to a young pastor, which is needful. And Paul says to that young pastor, Timothy, he says, you know what? There's a man in our city. His name is Alexander. He just called him out in a written letter. Alexander, his trade is a coppersmith. And he has done me great harm. And let me read what he says. He's done me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. In other words, he's not going to fight this battle. He's got something much more important to do than mess with this guy. He said, the Lord's going to take care of that. And then Paul teaches us, and let me get back to settling out of court. Then Paul, in the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, teaches us about lawsuits. Because in the Corinthian church, believers were taking believers to court before unbelieving judges. They were all messed up in their, their disputes. And so they'd go to the lost judge, the unregenerate, the non-Christian, the unbelieving judge. And Paul said, what's going on with that? And watch what he says. Now listen to this very carefully. Verse 7, you, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Just the fact that you have to go to court with one another is a defeat to you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Man, can you swallow that? Why not just lose it? In these verses, he even teaches us what's supposed to happen in the church. Watch this. That means if you've got a dispute with somebody, say you both own a company and you're working together and there's a big dispute and you can't figure it out. Paul says just get some people in the church. Go in a room, present both cases, and let them judge it. (laughs) could you do that you should do that that's what the scripture is teaching us rather than getting that big shiny lawyer that's going to get you more money than you deserve one call that's all 
I hurt my big toe and I got $175,000. Basically, sometimes you just got to take it. That's all there is to it. I heard an account this past week of a, of a businessman in a community here, that uh, small business, small community, and he was asked a question about what is the hardest thing about owning your own business. And without hesitation, he said the hardest thing is to collect credit, people that have charged from you to collect credit. And so the question was put to him, well, so what do you do? You go after them? He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, uh, relationships are important. And he said, we just work it down, work it out. He said, write it off, whatever. Now, this is not a business practice that somebody owes you $150,000. We're not talking about that. We're talking about just small things. Why lose a relationship over a small thing? He said, and because of that, I believe that's why God is prospering me so much. So th this, he, he, herein is the, the, the deal, folks. Here it is. A victory in the kingdom of God can look like a loss in the kingdom of the world. We're in an upside-down kingdom. It doesn't work all the way the world works all the time. We're in this world. We use the things of this world, not abusing the things of this world. But we are foreigners in this land, and we think differently, and we live differently. We respond differently. And if you're responding like the world, there's a time that you need to get on your knees before the Lord and say, I need a change of heart and mind, Lord, and I want to do things the way the kingdom does it. And if I lose, I lose. God is our victory anyway. God will repay, won't he? He will. Third thing about this heart of love is that the Lord is going to teach us to have a heart of love for our enemies. In the 43rd verse, if you think that, you know, the law wasn't enough, if you think that Jesus wasn't going deep enough, take a deep breath because now he's going to take us even deeper. He's like, yeah, I'm not finished yet. He said, you have heard that it was said. Here it goes again. He said, this is what you've been taught your whole life. This is what you, the way you've interpreted everything. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, let me say this right now to help you out. Nowhere in the scripture does it ever teach us to hate our enemy. You will not find that. But he's saying, this is what you've been taught. This is where you've been living. Love your neighbor as yourself, but hate your enemy. And he said, I'm going to correct that. But I say to you, love your enemies. Now, that had different meanings to different people in that crowd, as it may have in this room here. Love your enemies. You had Jews and Gentiles. They didn't get along very much. The Jews looked down on the Gentiles. The Gentiles could care less about these Jewish people. You had Roman soldiers looking on. I'm telling you what, there's a lot of hate between Gentiles and Romans who were, who were Gentiles and also Jewish people. There were tax collectors there, tax collectors who had sort of switched sides, working for the Romans against the Jewish people. There were the religious leaders who were trying to maintain their, their standard and their authority and their power over people who were, good, who were just being bombarded with this true teaching of the heart. And so basically what he said, he said, look around. I want you to love those that are different from you. I want you to love your enemies. The word enemy really means those that hate you. It's easy to love people. Well, I will, let me take that back. Sometimes it's even hard to love people that love us. We haven't even got to first base yet. We're like running down. We're running out of the baseline. So speak. I can't even love my wife who loves me. I'm having trouble loving my mama. We're in the elementary stages. And here Jesus is putting to us today, love your enemy. And kind of it's like, come on, Jesus, love my enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, those that are different from you, and pray. Not only love, but pray for those who persecute you. It's just an extension of the Beatitudes that he started this thing with. Love those and pray for those who despitefully use you and abuse you. And then verse 45, he gives the reason why. He says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, that you might be like God. That's, that's, that's this whole thing. Jesus has got us in a sanctification process to make us like him. That's the whole goal of what's going on. The goal is not that God would prosper everything you do and bless you and give you a good life and give you a nice car and a big house and all that. that psh, he's transforming you into his image through a sanctification process that leads to glorification for eternity. This is a big deal. This is a big deal that you didn't found yourself in. It's a big deal, okay? 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It's just like this morning, early before some of you got up, it was raining. And then when we woke up, it was sun shining. And the thing about it is, is that if you've got a godly farmer here who loves God, who serves God, he's got his cornfield, his 50 acres, and he's planted his corn, and it rains on his corn, he's like, praise God, thank you, Jesus, for blessing me beyond measure for the abundant life. I just praise you, Lord God. But right next to him is this ungodly farmer who cares less about anybody, just a wicked man. And guess what? When it rained on, the, on this guy's corn, it rained on his corn too. And when the sun came out, it came out on both their fields. You know some ungodly people in your life that done you harm, and guess what? You know what? When the, economy, when the stock market is good, guess what their stock's doing? <laughs> what we want is this. What we think is this. What we hope is this. This is where we are. Lord, bless me and curse them. Bless me, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the heart of love you've given me. By the way, Lord, would you just wreck them? That's why in Psalms it says, do not, please, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Quit, rejo quit rejoicing when that person or that group of people fail. Don't waste your time on it anymore. Let's go up a little bit higher. Let's move a little bit higher. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying that God desires for us to treat people who do good and who do evil with the same heart. Because know this, folks. Eventually, God is going to judge every person. Not only that, he's going to call us into judgment for every idle word we speak. Right there, that just cut our talking time in at least half. You understand? God's not going to let anything slip through the cracks. No one's pulling anything over on God. The one that is using and abusing people who never get caught by our police or our FBI, don't worry, they're already caught by God, and eventually God brings judgment on that. That's who he is. However, it's time for the church to hang up their black robe and take their gavel and set it down and walk away from the judgment seat of all of humanity and start to love people, including our enemies. He tops it off. He just says in verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. They were right there. Oh, my goodness. Like, and, 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 and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. It's like, whoa, I'm sitting right here. I'm listening to you. I'm a Gentile. Gentile said, wow, look at that. We made it into the message. <laughs> you know, he's talking about us. Must be good to be a Gentile. You know what it is, folks? The kingdom of God doesn't show partiality because God doesn't. Contrary to what a lot of people feel in their theological thinking, God loves all people. He does. You know what? He kicked down a wall to get to me. He did, man. He broke down every lie against my life to get to me. He left the 99, the good church folk, and he initiated a relationship with a person who was his enemy. That's what Romans 5.5 5 says. You know, it talks about the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts so that we can love other people. Isn't that amazing? That God changes our heart. He comes after you. He initiates a relationship with you. You respond to that. He gives you eternal life. He sheds the, the, the power of love in your hearts by the wonderful Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden you are changed and you have a different outlook on people. And when you see people the way they really are, hurting and in pain, and even on their way to eternal judgment, something happens inside of you when you have the Holy Spirit in you. Then he goes on, verse 48, he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And right there I just say, sitting on the side of the mountain in my little tunic, eating my little piece of stale bread, and I say, enough is enough. 
it was all right until now, and now you say, I've got to be perfect. Enough is enough, Jesus. You know, Jesus had a way of doing that. In the sixth chapter of John, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And they didn't understand that, and so they thought he was getting into some kind of weirdness, and so people just left him. But really what Jesus was saying was, it's time now to get serious about what's going on. See, God is serious about what is going on in our life. He's serious about this thing called the kingdom of God. He's serious about the cross and the resurrection and the glorification. He's serious about eternity. He's serious about the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. That's in his plan. He's serious about that, and he wants us to mature. That's what the word perfect means. Of course, you're not God. You'll never be God. But he said, I want you to grow up. The Apostle Paul said, he said in, in Hebrews, he said, I want you to grow up. He said, you should be teaching other people, but I still got to give you a little bottle of milk because you haven't grown. You haven't matured. And one of the best ways I know to mature is let the kingdom of God, let the word of God work its way in your life. Let it grind things in your life. And it will do that. The wheels of God, they, they grind exceedingly slow, but they grind exceedingly fine. I can't look back and say, well, how much did I grow from yesterday at 3 p.m.? I, I, no, but I can now look back and say, you know, 30 years ago, I've grown a bunch. Now, Romans says this, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, while we were yet enemies. See, Jesus loved his enemies, my goodness. So I'm going to do the same thing for my enemies. I'm going to have a heart of love in spite of anger. I'm going to have a heart of love concerning retaliation. And I'm going to have a heart of love to love my enemies. And I'm going to do that with mercy and grace. Because that's the mercy and grace that was extended to me and you. Come on, let's just give what we've been given. You know what mercy is? Mercy is didn't, I didn't, he didn't give me what I deserved, judgment and death. And mercy, I mean grace is he gave me what I didn't deserve. I didn't get what I deserved, and I got what I didn't deserve. That's what Jesus has done for us. So real quick, here are just some things that will help you get through things with a heart of love. You ready? You can just take these home with you. Number one is just a revelation of God's love. I wish I could give revelation to you, but revelation comes from God. And you get revelation by seeking God. No seeking God, very little revelation. Seeking God, much revelation. He knows if we're serious or not. And he answers. The seriousness of the believer's heart gets the attention of God. We call it faith. It gets God's attention. He says, now I can speak something to this person. This revelation of God's love. First, it starts with how much he loves you. Then it's, it, it goes on to how much he loves people. And then it develops into how much you love people. And then there is surrender to God's plan. Not my plan, God's plan. I surrender to that. I don't know it all. It's progressive. It's moving forward. Sometimes it doesn't look like it's moving at all. Sometimes I understand it, sometimes I don't. Sometimes it makes sense to me, sometimes it doesn't. But I'm surrendering, God. I'm going to be a leaf in your brook. I'm just floating with you, God. I don't exactly know everything, but I'm surrendered completely. And God knows whether or not we're surrendered. And to the degree that we're surrendered is the degree that he's able to show us his will for our life. And then last, we align our hearts with God's word. Because the word is the final authority in our life. But if there's no word in our life, it's hard to understand what God is doing. But when we're filled with the word of God, Every situation that comes our way, the Holy Spirit will do something really supernatural. He will call up the Word of God out of your spirit because it's in there. It's there. And He reaches down and He draws it out to apply it to your life to help you to be and do everything that God has said in this message. Not just do. Don't get the do first. Get the be first. Be this. Do that. Amen? Come on, let's close our eyes just for a moment. Just for, give God just a few seconds. First of all, if you're in the place right now in this, this 
message, this, this service seems so odd to you. It's almost like you feel like you're an outsider and it's like, what's going on here? I understand that. But I can say this beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is calling you to a relationship with him. And you don't have to understand anything except that right now you're separated from him and that he loves you and wants you to come into his family. And the Holy Spirit does that. It doesn't come from a preacher. But as you're sitting there, if that's you and you say, Pastor Van, that's me, I believe that God is calling me to a relationship that I don't have. And you want to respond today. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And as I pray, just open up your heart to God. Just open it up right now. And say something like this, just underneath your breath, just even in your mind to the Lord. Say, Father, uh, in the name of Jesus, because Jesus died for me, I'm coming to you and saying, I receive what Jesus has done for me. I thank you for it. I receive forgiveness of my sin, God, everything that I've ever done wrong against you, who I've been, God. I ask you to forgive me and come live with me and show me your ways. I surrender today in the name of Jesus. And then for you in this room who you've been following Jesus, you're a disciple, and I'm sure there's degrees of you in this room. I want you just to open up your heart right now and say, Lord, what I've heard today, I want it to become a part of my life. I want to love my enemies. I don't want to be one that retaliates the way the world does. Lord, I'm going to speak right of people. I'm going to have love for people. And I'm going to thank you right now, Lord, that I'm changed today. That this word will resonate in my heart. And that it will change me more into the image of Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord. I honor you and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.